All right, welcome back to part three of our experimental design explainer, this time focusing on true experiments. In our prior videos, we learned that elements of a true experiment are that you have a representative sample that's randomly assigned to groups you do different things to. This leads to the ability to identify direct causality which we've represented as if we poke him, he giggles, and if we don't, don't poke him, he doesn't giggle. That would mean that if we're a true experiment, if we found this out, that poking <laughs> causes giggling for the Pillsbury Doughboy. All right, so a great reference for things on experimental design online is materials posted by Professor Emmy Swisher and to note about the representative sample part of true experiments, he actually highlights that in many cases, you are not able to get random selection. In one case, it may have to do with you have people volunteering to be in a study and you're just happy to have them in the study. Or ethically, you're not able to get a completely representative sample that you randomly select. For instance, for a class, uh, if we wanted to study the impact of some new things we're doing in a class, we can't tell students which classes they're taking. Students have the autonomy to choose which classes they sign up for. So who's in that class is not a random selection. S the second thing I want to point out from some of the things that Professor Switcher puts online is about the doing different things to different groups. And what I'd really like to highlight here is our one of our big points is that you actually must poke the treatment group and not poke the other control group it is more than just asking questions or having two different groups who are different and you're looking at how those differences might relate to something else so for true experiments you're actually doing something you're poking a treatment group so let's go ahead and jump in and start talking about three broad types of experimental designs. Pre-experiments, really you can't learn anything about causality from these, and you really aren't gonna learn much about relationships, period. Things called quasi-experiments have some explanatory power, but it's reduced from a true experiment, frequently because you lack random assignment. And then true experiments is what we're aiming for here, where if we poke him, he giggles, right? <laughs> and if we don't poke him, he doesn't giggle, we're actually identifying causality. All of this being said, to actually achieve that high of a goal of true experiments is very challenging, if not impossible, in real world scenarios, working with real world people. But having the ideal of a true experiment helps us understand some of the limitations um, of maybe what we are realistically able to do. We're gonna talk about four different types of true experiments. I'm gonna start off with one called post-test only with a control. We randomly assign people either to be poked or not. And throughout the next few slides, I'll be using this blue color to represent control and the green text as in this observation to represent the treatment group. So treatment in green, control in the blue. So let me give you an example of where you might do this. You might do this if a pretest is impossible. I want to know the impact of a training course on people who have never driven a forklift before on their forklift driving abilities. I'm not going to let someone drive a forklift before they have the course, so we can't get a pretest. Or if you're dealing with things about like user satisfaction with certain services, you can't assess their satisfaction with a service they've never had, so a pretest isn't possible. Secondly, um, if the pre-testing might um, cause more problems than it helps in your study, like it trains someone in the test itself. Maybe a new way to teach statistics only improves learning over the status quo of how you teach statistics if a student takes the pre-test prior to the teaching. And out in the real world, they're not going to be doing that, A, and even within this study, you may not really be uncovering the true effects. How are you going to analyze this? You're frequently get where you would run an independent samples t-test, where you're in this case your independent variables, uh, independent variable sorry, is either treatment 
or control, the variable is their experimental group. And those are the two levels, the treatment or the control. A second type of true experiment, which is really a classic experimental design is the pre post with a control group. Let's give an example. Let's say you measured the number of bird strikes that were reported at 20 airports. Then you randomly assign 10 airports to test some new or a new bird mitigation strategy. Then you, this is the new bird mitigation strategies. And then you measure the number of bird strikes at all the airports again. After doing that, if you saw changes in the group that had the treatment of these new bird mitigation strategies, and you didn't see any changes in the control group, then being able to ascribe what you saw as, as improvements in reductions in, in bird strikes uh, to those bird mitigation strategies, you have a strong basis for doing so. Analysis of this, um, probably the one I'm talking about the most is this first one, which is take the change in performance, so bird strikes after minus bird strikes before, and then just do an independent samples t-test where your independent variable is, are they in the control group or the treatment group, just like with the post-test only. Um, you can run other um, ways of analyzing this uh, with multi-factor ANOVA, where in this case your variables would be your independent variable would be, are they in the pretest or the post-test, A, and then B, uh, were they in the treatment or in the control? And by looking at the interaction term in that analysis, you would be able to see if the effect of the treatment was the same um, from pre to post as it is for the control. Third true experiment I wanna talk about is a pre and post with multiple treatments or levels. Very similar to what we saw before, but now let's say you wanted to try more than one bird mitigation, bird strike mitigation approach. So instead of just one treatment, you have two treatments, you have multiple treatment groups. The analysis in this case, if you're working with the change scores, you just move it from a t-test to ANOVA because you have three or more levels now. Uh, or you could continue looking at the repeated measures ANOVA where you're looking at the interaction term between one variable pre post and the other variable uh, control or treatment. A fourth experimental design is a factorial design. And in this case, I need to explain this notation a little bit more. So I have factor A and factor B in my model up above. And let's just say for factor a, it's one bird mitigation approach, and factor B is a second bird mitigation approach for bird strikes at airports. So it says, say, a minus one like this means you're not going to apply um, bird mitigation approach one, and a not minus one here means that you're not going to apply bird mitigation approach B, so that's our control group. And then our other three groups are all the combinations of either just applying bird mitigation approach B, just applying A, or applying both of them. You can see this is kind of an extension of the prior true experiment, um, but by separating out the factors, you're going to be able to attribute impact to different independent factors. Uh, the analysis you would do now, if you're looking at the change scores, is a multi-factor ANOVA because you have two factors in this example. But you could still use the repeated measures ANOVA that we talked about before, where one of your factors is pre versus post. Just as an example, you know, one of our mitigation approaches could be we're going to install some special bird radars at the airports. And one of our other mitigation approaches is we're going to put some fake plastic owls on posts out in key locations in the airport. Our control group we don't do either of those. Um, our second group, we just have the fake owls out. Our next group, we just have the bird radar. And the last one, we have both. If we had those 20 airports, we would, and we wanted to have a balanced design, we would assign five airports randomly to each of these four treatment conditions.
All right, so you may have noticed that all but one of those true experiments had a pretest. So it shouldn't be a surprise to figure out that there are benefits of having a pretest. Uh, one of them is that if people drop out of your study or subjects drop out, you're able to see if they drop the people that dropped out of the control are similar or different from the people that dropped out of the treatment or treatments. Secondly, maybe the metric you care about is something you can only measure if you have a pretest, something like the lift from before to after. Um, you are able to just go and compare the treatment and control pretests to evaluate if random assignment was effective um, at having groups that were similar to each other on important measures. And then finally, if you are not able to randomly assign people to treatments and control, you can go back and compare the different groups you ended up with on key measures to see how similar they are or how different they might be. Now all this comes at a cost. Uh, one of the costs is just practical, time and money to run the pretest. Uh, the second one is an external validity issue called pretest sensitization, which means that maybe the effects you're seeing are only there when there's a pretest that comes before the treatment. So you're not just measuring the effect of the treatment, you're measuring the effect of the pretest and the treatment together. I'm going to throw in as a bonus uh, a fifth true experimental design just as an example. It's called the Solomon 4 group and it's a combination of the pre-post with control uh, as boxed in in blue and the post only with control. And if you're really concerned about some of the negatives of particularly this negative um, of running a pretest, you're able to actually assess that because some of your groups did not have these ones down here did not get a pretest. And so if you're seeing the same impact in, in that, in those two, when you compare those two to each other, as you're seeing in the pre-post with control, then you can be more confident that it's not the pretest that's actually important in causing the changes or the differences that you're seeing between treatment and control. And one final thing is the difference between a control group and a comparison group. Control group we've been talking about really the whole time in this video. You do something to one group, you do something else or nothing at all to another group. So for instance, when we're comparing the two queuing patterns to enter Disney World, we are, we are changing um, the way in which people are getting in to the park. That's uh, in, in one of our groups. The other ones we're keeping it the same. A comparison group is still things you're comparing, but the difference between them is not something you did to them. So let's say we wanted to take our same example of going into Disney World. If we said, okay, well, let's flag people as families with kids or not families with kids. Um, and if we're comparing those two groups, we didn't do that to them. That, that That's sort of like a demographic difference between the two groups. And that's considered comparison groups. It has a similar kind of, uh, of um, role having comparison groups, um, but it's not the same as control group. In part, you can imagine because of that lack of random assignment. So to wrap up, we now know that if we want to get as close as we can to direct causality, where if we poke him, he giggles. If we don't poke him, he does not giggle that therefore poking causes giggling. <laughs> there are true experiments or what we want to aim for. We talked about a post test only with control, a pre post with control. We can do that same thing with multiple treatments, not just uh, one treatment. And then the factorial design as a way of looking at multiple factors, not just a single factor for a true experiment. All right, everybody say goodbye to Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs>